So the day we've all been waiting for has finally arrived. The Obi-Wan Kenobi series is finally complete and the journey of Obi-Wan Kenobi for this time period is at an end. So as usual, let's break down all of the connections and references to the books, games, comics and other TV shows, and there are plenty of them to go over in this episode, especially if you're a fan of the animated shows. So hit that subscribe button and let's get into it. So the episode begins off with Reva in a disguise on Tatooine, searching for the man named Owen, who she found out about from the hollow transmission last episode. Before she gets much further though, we zoom straight out into space where Vader is at the command of a skirmish against a ship the Obi-Wan and the Force Sensitives are on. Now, very interestingly, the camera lingers on a shot of that young boy and his mother from the last few episodes, and this is very fitting because it was recently confirmed that this is Corrin Horn. Corrin Horn is one of the biggest names from Luke's Jedi Order in Star Wars Legends, and now he's right back in canon. After this, Roken mentions that the hyperdrives are almost back online, so they're going to head for the planet Tessin. I went deep into the Jedi archives on that one, and it appears to be a brand new planet. We'll probably get more on that in a comic or a book later down the line, and I'm sure it'll be in the reference book once that releases. Obi-Wan realizes though that they aren't going to make it. The reason for this, in part, is that the motivator of the ship is shot. Now, if you'll remember from Star Wars Episode 4, A New Hope, the motivator went bad on R5-D4. This tells us that the part of the ship having issues is the artificial intelligence. The motivator is what powers the ship's AI, at least in part. After this, we cut back to Tatooine, where Luke and his uncle Owen are in town looking for a new belt for their speeder. It's at this point where Owen is warned that somebody is coming after him. This leads the two to rush back home and prepare for what is coming. Next up, Obi-Wan tells the other survivors of his plan to give himself up so that they can survive. This angers both Leia and Corrin Horn's mother, Nisha, but Haja Estri promises to keep Leia safe. Back on the Lars homestead, Baru refuses to leave and put anyone else in danger, so she opens up their hidden stash and pulls out a very large blaster definitely fit for two farmers out in the middle of nowhere in the Dune Sea. After this, Obi-Wan hands Leia Tala's holster from earlier and promises her that everything will be alright. Then though, the time is finally here. Obi-Wan once again calls out to his master Qui-Gon in the Cosmic Force, begging one more time for his guidance. Obi-Wan knows that what he is about to face will change him forever. As Kenobi escapes in his lone ship, Vader can sense his old master and knows what must be done. Not long after this, the Lars Homestead perimeter alerts start blaring, warning that somebody is on their land. Reva limps forward, carrying her injury from Vader, and is determined to do whatever it takes to make it to Luke Skywalker. As the Old Master and Apprentice put their ships down, they land on a dark, barren, foggy moon. This moon is currently unidentified, but again, I'm sure we'll get it explained in a book, definitely the reference book, and most likely a comic to go along with it. With the fight about to begin, Vader asks his former friend, Have you come to destroy me? To which Obi-Wan uses the iconic line from Revenge of the Sith, I will do what I must, mirroring his words from Mustafar. Obi-Wan then pulls out his iconic two-finger stance which is seen many times over his life, including against General Grievous in Revenge of the Sith, against Maul in Star Wars Rebels, and in many, many times over the Clone Wars. Darth Vader then pulls out the same line he used in Star Wars Rebels, Twilight of the Apprentice, telling Obi-Wan, then you will die. Then you will die. He said these exact same words to Ahsoka Tano before fighting her on Malachor. Next, the tension finally boils over and the former Master and Apprentice do battle like they never have before. Channeling all of their strength, power and regret into the fight, the two give it their all. In the middle of the battle, Vader destroys the ground to send Obi-Wan tumbling into a sinkhole. This is exactly what happened to Ahsoka Tano in her fight with Vader in Twilight of the Apprentice, until Ezra Bridger saved her using the World Between Worlds. Next, Reva goes absolutely ballistic at the Lars homestead and she manages to track down Luke. I'm pretty sure he doesn't see the red saber which would have a few issues for A New Hope and canon, since he obviously doesn't know what a saber is in that movie, but it's hard to tell if he actually saw it. Cutting back to Obi-Wan in the pit, he begins hearing memories of Anakin's words from the last 10 years, mostly from Revenge of the Sith. This gives Kenobi the strength to burst out from under the ground and rush back towards Vader. During their second encounter, Vader uses the same tricks he did against Reva by holding his saber back with the Force, but it's not enough. These tricks just won't work on Kenobi. Kenobi lifts a flurry of rocks behind him and flings them at Vader with violent speed. I'm pretty sure this is a direct reference to an old piece of ILM art where Obi-Wan lifts a grid of blasters up behind him and fires them all using the Force. Great little callback and an absolutely tremendous scene. After this, Obi-Wan swings his saber and slices off a part of Vader's mask, revealing Anakin's face underneath. This is exactly what happens in that same Star Wars Rebels episode with Ahsoka Tano, and his modulator cuts between Anakin and Vader, just like in that episode. 
and this is pretty symbolic because Ahsoka takes off the left side of Anakin's mask, Obi-Wan takes off the right side of Anakin's mask, and then Luke takes off the whole mask in A New Hope. That's a nice little parallel, or a three-way parallel, and it shows you that those were the three people who ultimately brought him back to the light. Obi-Wan apologizes for everything he's done, but Anakin is truly gone. Obi-Wan believes that there is still good in Anakin, but that is shattered in the moment Anakin tells him that he chose to become Vader. Although Obi-Wan doesn't directly say it, this is truly the last moment that Obi-Wan had hope in him. We now finally have an explanation for that line, Obi-Wan once thought as you did to Luke. After this, Obi-Wan also says, goodbye Darth. Again, kind of explaining why Obi-Wan calls him Darth in A New Hope. This is truly the point where Obi-Wan separates Anakin from Darth Vader. And at this point, he believes Anakin is dead, so he has no other choice but to call him Darth. Back on Tatooine, Reva prowls the Dune Sea to find young Luke, and she eventually does. But she simply can't bring herself to kill Luke because she saw herself in him. Eventually, Reva realizes that this is not the life for her, and Obi-Wan tells them that they are now both free. Reva is free from a life of hatred and revenge, and Kenobi has a huge weight lifted off him now, accepting that this was not his failure, but Anakin's own choice. Back inside of Vader's castle on Mustafar, he makes a hollow call with the Emperor, who is concerned that his thoughts dwell on Obi-Wan. Vader, however, tells him that he only serves Darth Sidious and will not be distracted again. This is a pretty big appearance, actually, because none of the leaks mentioned Darth Sidious or Palpatine appearing, so it's pretty good to have one surprise at least left from the leaks. All the way back on Alderaan, Leia is getting ready to greet a special guest, and she puts on Tala's holster as a symbol of respect. This special guest happens to be Obi-Wan fulfilling his promise from earlier in the episode, and he tells Leia that she has great traits from both of her parents, gifts from both Anakin and Padme, but really can't tell her any more than that. Back at Obi-Wan's cave, he packs his things up and dresses in some familiar attire from his time in the Order, before arriving at the Lars homestead. This is also the same outfit he uses in both Star Wars Legends and the Star Wars 2015 comics, which he featured heavily in. Awesome connection there, especially if you read the comics. Once there, Owen finally lets him meet the boy, likely since the first time he was dropped off at the end of Revenge of the Sith, and Obi-Wan greets him with his famous greeting, Hello there. And it honestly sounded like they mixed in some Alec Guinness hello there from A New Hope with the re-speecher technology. As Obi-Wan strolls into the desert, he finally sees the man he's been waiting for since he was given that special training from Yoda in Revenge of the Sith. Master Qui-Gon appears and leads him deeper into the desert, telling him that there is much more to learn. This is perfect because in a recent canon book, we learned that Qui-Gon actually managed to manifest himself as more than just a voice, and actually appear physically, literally like a few months before the Obi-Wan Kenobi series is set. So that was definitely put in there just to make this moment possible, so it's really cool to see. But there we have it, that is the end of the Star Wars Obi-Wan Kenobi series, unless they happen to do a season 2, which is a big rumour right now. Let me know what your rating for the series is out of 10 in the comments down below. Thanks so much for watching guys, I really hope you enjoyed the series and this video. If you did, leave a like and subscribe, as there'll be plenty more Star Wars lore videos coming on the channel. Thanks so much again, and I will see you in the next one.